and arguably one of the most important creators of the 20th century, Jack Kirby is responsible for so many iconic fictional characters, it's almost impossible to list them all. From Captain America, the Hulk, Etric and the Demon, to the X-Men, Fantastic Four, and the New Gods, the list of Kirby's contributions to popular fiction is simply mind-boggling. I'm Dave Baker, and today we're going to explain what Jack Kirby's life was really like and examine one of his lesser-known creations, The Eternals. Before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Total Nerd channel. Oh, and that's not enough. Leave a comment and uh, tell us what you'd like to see us explain in the future. Born Jacob Kurtzberg, Jack Kirby, like so many Jewish comics professionals in the 1940s, took on many pseudonyms. He frequently worked under the names Jack Curtis, Fred Sandy, Ted Gray, Lance Kirby, among countless others. Eventually, the now iconic Jack Kirby stuck, and the rest, as they say, is comic book history. Born in 1917, on August 28th on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, Kirby's parents were both Austrian Jewish immigrants. As a boy, Kirby became involved in gang culture due to the harsh conditions that surround Depression era New York. Many art historians have attributed a lot of the action and kineticism in Kirby's work to the fact that, unlike a lot of artists, Kirby got habitually embroiled in street fights as a young man. Actually, now that we're talking about it, Kirby being in a gang explains why he drew so many gangs of young boys early in his career, like uh, the Boy Commandos, Newsboy Legion, Yancey Street Gang, and the Young Allies. Here's hoping drawing all those kids beating the shit out of each other helped Kirby work through some of that, you know, trauma. Eh, you know what they say, comics is cheaper than therapy. Ostensibly self-taught, Kirby landed a job working at the Lincoln Newspaper Syndicate after a brief stint at the Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. This allowed Kirby to get his foot in the door, where he was able to eke out a living working on such strips as The Lone Rider, a really shitty Lone Ranger knockoff, and Your Health Comes First, an advice single panel strip. Kirby's work from this time period is almost unrecognizable as his. Everything looks like it was drawn in like 15 minutes. Largely because it was drawn in 15 minutes. After slugging it out in the trenches for a few years, Kirby made a name for himself as a diligent worker who could produce large amounts of work under extreme circumstances. Simultaneously, the popularity of comic books were skyrocketing, and this led veteran illustrators like Will Eisner to start up production studios, the most famous of which being the aptly named Eisner Iger Studio, where cartoonists would be employed as either writers, pencilers, inkers, or letters. They would then work as an assembly line, producing pages for publishers and newspapers. In 1940, Kirby would find his first long-term creative partner in Joe Simon, a writer, artist, and later editor. They would initially work for the Fox Feature Syndicate for $15 a week, and then later moved to Martin Goodman's Timely Comics, which would later become Marvel Comics. There, they would co-create the now iconic Captain America. In 1943, Kirby would be drafted into the Army. After undergoing basic training at Camp Stewart in Savannah, Georgia, he was assigned to the 11th Infantry Regiment. From there, he was one of the many men who landed on Omaha Beach in Normandy on August 23rd, just two and a half months after D-Day. While overseas, one of Kirby's many responsibilities was to scout ahead of his troops and draw maps of the surrounding countryside. This was obviously exceedingly dangerous, and the fact that Kirby survived this is nothing short of astonishing. After returning from the war, Kirby and Simon reunited and began working for Harvey Comics. From there, they segued to McFadden Productions, where they ostensibly created the romance comic genre from scratch. That's right, the men behind Captain America and many other superheroes from the 1930s and 40s also created the romance comic genre. With titles like Young Romance, Young Love, and many others, Kirby and Simon saw a massive uptick in readers who wanted to live vicariously through their romantic leads. Hmm. However, despite soaring sales, Kirby and Simon were woefully underpaid for their efforts. They eventually struck out on their own under their new publishing name, Mainline Comics. They produced four titles, including Foxhole, a war comic, Bullseye, Western Scout, a Western comic, Police Trap, obviously a crime comic, and In Love, a romance comic, because that's what they were known for. Regrettably, Mainline was put out of business partially due to their books being featured in the anti-comic book Red Scare HUAC trials, which spawned from Frederick Worsham's book Seduction of the Innocent that blamed all of society's ills on comics. Finally, they were sued out of existence by Crestwood, one of Simon and Kirby's former employers, who noticed that Mainline was using artwork that Kirby had created for Young Love comics, which they obviously didn't own. Needless to say, Mainline lost the suit and subsequently went bankrupt. Objectively, at the lowest point in his career, Kirby would return to Timely, which would soon rebrand as Marvel Comics. His determination and work ethic would transform this setback into a career-making winning streak. 
During this time period, he would work alongside former assistant Stanley Lieber, aka Stan Lee, to co-create some of pop culture's most enduring cultural icons like Iron Man, the Fantastic Four, the Black Panther, Silver Surfer, the Hulk, the X-Men, Thor, the Inhumans, and virtually hundreds more. After being disrespected and underpaid by Marvel, Kirby spent two years negotiating a contract with DC Comics to enter their creative stable to write, draw, and edit a slate of his own titles. This eventually evolved into him taking over four books, three of these he would create whole cloth, Mr. Miracle, New Gods, and Forever People, and then an additional one that he took over due to a lack of a steady creative team, Superman's pal, Jimmy Olsen. Over his time on these books, which would eventually become known as the Fourth World, Kirby would redefine what DC cosmic stories could be in terms of scale and grandeur. He'd also create an army of new characters, most iconically the uber big bad of the DC universe, Darkseid. Despite being currently lauded for its innovation and deep probing themes, upon release the Fourth World books were not met with critical acclaim. Ultimately, Kirby served the duration of his contract at DC, and then they cancelled all the Fourth World books. They had Kirby even go so far as to wrap up his mega epic tale in a one-off graphic novel that casual readers to this day are probably unaware of. In 1975, Stan Lee would announce that Jack Kirby was returning to Marvel. However, Jack would not be partnering with his old co-creator this time. The two still had bad blood between them for multiple reasons. Jack felt that Stan took too much credit for his loose dialoguing over the stories that Jack had written and drawn. Kirby also felt that Stan had done little to nothing to assist him in regaining ownership of nearly thousands of pages of original artwork, a virtual fortune in original art sales. Marvel just refused to return these pages to the Kirby family. Kirby would go on to write and draw numerous projects during this time period at Marvel. From the then much maligned Captain America and the Madness Bomb story to the now iconic 2001 A Space Odyssey adaptation, Kirby produced some of his most idiosyncratic and personal work during this time period. And now we arrive at The Eternals. The Eternals are far and away one of Kirby's most neglected and unsung creations. The Eternals first appeared in July of 1976 in the aptly named Eternals No. 1. The series only lasted 12 issues on its initial release. The Eternals starts with the revelation that when the Celestials visited Earth 5 million years ago, they performed genetic experiments on mankind. This produced two races, the Deviants, who were hideous, monstrous beings, and the Eternals human-esque people of virtually immortal lifespans. The Eternals were so highly intelligent that they rapidly became technologically advanced. They created technology that allowed them to go into hiding for almost a millennia, even travel into space. The plot of the Eternals centers around a cosmic narrative that'll have you asking, didn't I already read this issue of the New Gods? The protagonist of almost all of these stories is Icarus, a character so stock Kirby that you'll practically have to double check he's not Captain Victory or Orion. The other members of the Eternals include Kingo, Fastos, Sprite, Ajax. The initial 12 issues of the Eternals centers around the revelations that the Deviants and the Eternals have been returning to Earth in order to battle, in a classic retcon that eh, didn't quite go anywhere. Kirby attempted to establish that the Eternals have been behind the scenes for eons, pulling the strings. Eee. Needless to say, eh, nobody really picked up on these threads. The majority of these issues tell simple, clean stories about Icarus and company striking out on adventures and engaging in unlikely friendships with humans. Icarus ends up bonding with a human doctor researcher type named Daniel Damien, and his daughter, Icarus's love interest, Margot. And from there, Kirby attempts to build the framework that would create a new line of epic stories. However, the book was ostensibly over before it began. Kirby could draw like four pages a day, which means when he put out a book in two weeks. So when you do the math, he really only worked on Eternals for like six months before it was just canceled. From there, various writers and artists have tried to mine Kirby's basic setup for new stories, most notably Neil Gaiman and John Romita Jr. when they took over the reboot of The Eternals in 2006. The big twist here is that Sprite cast a spell and all the Eternals forgot who they really were. The story sees Icarus remembering who he truly is and then embarking on a mission, traveling around the globe, trying to help the other Eternals remember their past. This setup is uh, weirdly similar to the Warrior Magazine reboot of the iconic Marvel Man comic that uh, Alan Moore wrote in the 1980s. It's almost like Neil Gaiman must have been Alan Moore's assistant. Spoiler alert, well, he wasn't really his assistant, but yeah, Alan Moore showed Neil Gaiman the ropes and basically taught him everything he knows. 
This reboot didn't really catch on, and ultimately, the Eternals returned to their C-list status as Kirby characters that everybody has a few stray issues of, but uh, very few of us have actually read. So what do you think? Will we ever have a creator of the likes of Jack Kirby again? Will the Eternals pull a blade and become a massive movie franchise despite being obscure comics characters? Or will they be the first MCU failure? I mean, at, at this point, it'd be really surprising to me if anything short of like a stilt man movie caused the MCU to stumble. Bye. If you like this video, please comment below and let us know what other area of nerd culture needs an explainer. And in the meantime, like, comment, and subscribe for more Total Nerd videos.